Michael Hammer, 10401, Wilshire Boulevard, Los Angeles, California. Now, just what do you do for a living? According to our information, he calls himself a private investigator. His specialty is divorce cases. Just how do you achieve all this? You crawl under beds? Nothing so primitive. He has a secretary. At least that's what he calls her. She's a very attractive young woman. He sicks her onto the husbands, and before you know it, he's got his evidence, and he's ready for the big squeeze. Who do you sick onto the wives, Mr. Hammer? That's his department. All right, you've got me convinced. I'm a real stinker. Hi, my name is Dominic Griffin. I'm a film critic, and you're watching The Armchair Auteur. This is an ongoing video series I do. We talk about new movies, old movies, screenplay analysis, that sort of thing. So if you're the kind of person that likes movies, likes film culture, likes to see people pick it apart, please consider subscribing. Welcome back to November, everyone. This week's installment is going to be about the 1955 film from director Robert Aldrich, Kiss Me Deadly, one of the most positively electric films I've ever seen in my life. Now for this month I'm primarily sticking to movies from the 1930s and 1940s, but Kiss Me Deadly is a bit of an outlier having come out in the middle of the 50s. So it was released sort of at the outer edges of the genre's heyday, but I think it's such a lively interpretation of the form that it's absolutely impossible to leave out of the series. Now I hadn't seen Kiss Me Deadly in like some years, and in that time I'd completely forgotten most of the plot, but I hadn't shaken the unique energy this film is absolutely crackling with. From the backwards winding opening credits and the film's revolutionary feeling car footage all the way to its apocalyptic conclusion, Kiss Me Deadly is a noir that's both incredibly of its time in terms of thematic power and far ahead of it in terms of style and visual execution. The film is a loose adaptation of Mickey Spillane's titular novel starring his iconic PI character Mike Hammer, here portrayed by Ralph Meeker. The plot is relatively complex and to recount it beat by beat would be pretty pointless as many viewers of the film myself included, find its particulars to evaporate into fog the further they find themselves from the film's memorable closing images. It's nowhere near as convoluted as, say, like, I don't know, like the big sleep, but it's definitely in the conversation. The basics, though, are about a chance encounter between Hammer and a woman named Christina that he picks up on the side of the road. She's broken out of a mental facility and is on the run from some dangerous forces, but unlike other similar noirs where the morally questionable hero at least has a heart of gold for a dame in distress, Hammer genuinely doesn't seem to give a fuck about this woman outside of morbid curiosity. The only reason he spends the rest of the film chasing the great what's-it, a nebulous MacGuffin at the center of Christina's mystery, is that in trying to kill her, they almost kill Mike. If we don't... And because he thinks there could be something in it for him if he figures out this big conspiracy before the cops and the feds do. So what follows is what could best be described as the platonic ideal of the private eye flick. Hammer goes from random character to random character, asking questions, getting into fights, flirting with women, all the while fetch questing his way deeper into an intricate web, all leading to a threat so much larger than the lurid little world he lords over. The movie becomes a thrilling mystery with a grossly unlikable detective at its center who thinks he's two steps ahead of everyone else on the board until he finds out just how in over his head he truly is. Manhattan Project, Los Alamos, Trinity. The script, by leftist screenwriter A.I. Bezerides, takes Millian's book and dials the pulp up to a 10, honing in on how relentlessly cruel Mike Hammer is as a protagonist, while weaving anti-McCarthyism themes alongside a potent paranoia regarding the atomic age. Splane allegedly hated this adaptation because Bezerides, in his own personal distaste for the source material, made all of the unfortunate subtext of Hammer as a character direct text. He brings to the surface all the latent misanthropy at the core of the book and extrapolates it to a dark and fucked up narrative that nonetheless still luxuriates in the thrills and fun of the pulp paradigm. There's something truly remarkable about how casually sleazy Meeker's Hammer is and how other characters look at him like the monster he truly is. Open a window. It makes for a fascinating counterpoint with the way the narrative wrestles with the harrowing anxiety of the bomb, and living in a world where everyone in it is acutely aware of how fast they could all be blinked out from existence. In some ways, that looming Armageddon makes everyone's questionable and selfish, flexible morality a little bit easier to swallow. It's hard to look out for anyone except number one in a system so callous and so doomed. But the biggest reason Kiss Me Deadly rules so fucking hard is Aldrich's direction and cinematographer Ernest Laszlo's dynamic camera work. From the road careening car sequences, to the off-kilter compositions that place otherwise par for the course interview scenes into odd angles and curious framing, to the abrupt and brutal editing patterns that would go on to influence the French New Wave half a decade later, Kiss Me Deadly is a movie whose ambitious and uncharacteristic storytelling are matched, if not exceeded, by its constant, omnipresent visual flair. It's so interesting to watch a movie that is pitch-perfect film noir from start to finish, and it hits all the major boxes, ticks all the little things off the list of what you expect from one of these movies, but by the last 10 minutes or so, it blows up into this, like, very unique and very intense sort of almost like sci-fi film, to be, to be honest. You're going to recognize the closing moments of this movie because they were heavily referenced in The End of Raiders of the Lost Ark and also Pulp Fiction. 
But outside of its power as influence on later films that you know and love, it works so well as its own thing because it's so unique. Kiss Me Deadly is like the ideal film noir to show someone who finds the Maltese Falcon too quiet and talky. It's a gut punch of a film that would feel exciting and inventive even if it were released today. It's a noir that doesn't shy away from the surlier elements of the genre, and it does so with style to spare. It is not streaming anywhere that I can find, but I'm pretty sure it's rentable on a couple of different platforms, but Kiss Me Deadly is a must-see movie. If you're a physical media person, there's a really beautiful transfer uh, in the Criterion Collection that is totally worth seeing as well. Seriously, every time I rewatch this movie, it feels like the first time, and it's like this really unique feeling I get from it that I can't really compare to anything else. Maybe the first time I saw Mario Bava's Danger Diabolique, maybe, maybe, but yeah, it's, it's insane. Thank you for watching this video. If you guys liked it, please give it a thumbs up. If you have not subscribed, please consider subscribing. If you do subscribe, hit the bell icon so you get notifications when I put new videos. We've got a couple more Noir November videos throughout the month, as well as regular reviews of new releases and things of that nature. If you guys have any thoughts about Kiss Me Deadly, please put them in the comments below, and please make sure you're taking care of yourselves, wearing your masks, being good to each other, that sort of thing. Don't be like my camera. Bye.